So it's really my, my pleasure and my honor to, to be here um, uh, uh, hosting this uh, workshop on uh, improving outreach in plant science. I'm Jose Dinini. I'm an associate professor at Stanford University. And I am, I would uh, say kind of uh, an amateur in the field of outreach, but I really love to support uh, scientists who are at the frontiers of, of doing outreach in plant science. And I think um, we have a, a tremendous panel of uh, researchers today uh, from the uh, graduate level all, all the way to senior faculty level who are really innovating uh, outreach, uh, doing outreach in a very inclusive way and integrating across uh, different areas of plant science and different aspects of our community to um, really present the, the, the best uh, to the public and to students on the importance of, of plant science. So I'm really uh, excited to be here uh, to uh, host this and, and introduce you all to these fantastic pioneers in, in outreach. Okay, so I wanted to give you a, a, just a brief overview of the uh, outline for this workshop. So I'll first give um, some brief introductory um, comments, uh, and then we'll get to our uh, panelists and we'll hear uh, five recorded present, or we'll hear eight recorded presentations, five minutes each from our panelists. And this will allow you all to get a sense of the different areas of out outreach that are represented by our panelists. So they'll talk briefly about, about their work, about the areas that are, they're really passionate about. And then will be your opportunity to be able to interact and engage uh, with our panelists. So we'll have two breakout sessions, about 15 minutes a piece. And if technology permits, uh, ideally what we'll do is we'll have uh, the breakout sessions uh, open. Uh, you'll get to go into uh, specific rooms with pairs of panelists, and then we'll have a, a switch around um, midway through so that you can go into another breakout session and learn about other aspects of, of outreach. Okay, so we have a great audience. We have, uh, I guess, 50 par participants already. So thank you all uh, for coming. Let me move to the next. Okay, so I think all of us have a general sense of what science outreach is, but I think sometimes it's worthwhile thinking about, you know, formally speaking, what is science outreach? Uh, to think about the components that are involved in, in doing outreach effectively. So uh, one way of thinking about outreach is that it can mean uh, that uh, we're engaging with members of the public that are outside of our immediate professional community, right? So this is um, the Arabidopsis conference. We can consider ourselves part of an Arabidopsis uh, community or a plant science community or uh, more generally a STEM community. Uh, and this communication uh, it, that we're having with members of outside of our committee uh, relate to you know, our, the findings of our research, uh, field relevant knowledge and professional activities. Uh, and we're communicating this to students, to educators, government organizations and business entities. So this is in general, right, in a nutshell, what science outreach is. But why you're all probably here is that you're interested in, in taking your outreach uh, or entering into out outreach, taking your outreach to the next level or entering into outreach. So really the question is, well, what is effective outreach, right? We all, I think a lot of us have really good intentions um, to be able to share our passion for, for science and for plant biology, but how do we do this effectively in our communities? So as, uh, as a community, as we started to think about this, as the, um, uh, the Arabidopsis community has, has thought about this. I think it's important to think about how we can translate our good intentions into active, effective outreach. And so a, a few key terms uh, can come, come into play. So I think when, when thinking about creating effective outreach programs, we need to think about how our programs can be more innovative, inclusive, and integrative. So by innovative, I think what we mean is, you know, how do we create and evaluate and reward and share outreach activities that, that work and work well in plant science. For inclusive outreach, how do we excite the imagination of a broader section of our society? 
So how do we target not only those communities that are traditionally uh, heavily engaged in uh, academic science, but how do we impact a broad, broader portion of our uh, society, not only uh, within this country, but in other countries as well. And finally, how do we create outreach that's more integrated? So how do we uh, create outreach programs that are more than the sum of our, uh, their par parts? So how do we bring together the different parts of our community to be able to do this outreach more effectively? Now, again, good intentions, but there are also lots of challenges, particularly in plant science to doing effective outreach. Um, there's, of course, the cultural bias. Many of us uh, in this room and uh, doing uh, you know, plant, plant biology, plant science, uh, have inherent biases because we've been educated in institutions of higher learning. We have a particular um, kind of elite background uh, that we bring to the situation. And this, of course, is going to influence our own perspectives on, on, on what's important. Um, but of course, we're trying to engage with communities that might have uh, a different cultural biases. Opportunity gaps. So often the communities that we may want to target uh, may not be aware of the programs that we're creating. So how do we create programs and effectively share them across uh, communities where they'll be most impactful? There are also resource gaps, right? Many times outreach activities uh, require coordination, they require research, uh, they require uh, equipment and uh, reagents in order to be, to, to be done. So how do we fund these activities to make them uh, as effective as possible? Recruitment gaps. So if we think about the types, the, the, the people who are actually performing outreach, um, how can we include uh, a broader proportion of our, of our uh, you know, broader society in these outreach activities um, so that you know, we have faculty, graduate students, postdocs, uh, scientific staff that are representative of the communities that we're trying to engage with so that we can speak the same language, we can um, talk to them, uh, talk to our, our target, target audience uh, with the knowledge of, of the values that that community has. And specific to, to plants, of course, is uh, the general lack of plant awareness uh, in, in society. So plants are ubiquitous, vegetables are healthy, what could be more boring? We all know that plants are beautiful creatures. Uh, how do we communicate that more effectively? So, you know, I became interested in, in thinking about how to uh, improve the way in which we design and, and perform outreach. And so together with the uh, North American Arabidopsis Steering Committee, uh, I uh, helped uh, to develop a uh, workshop uh, a few years ago to um, focus on uh, in, uh, defining new ways in which we can improve outreach. So we did this by hosting a symposium that was specifically focused on uh, advances uh, in, in plant science outreach. And then we had a subsequent part of the workshop that was dedicated to uh, uh, researching the topic and ultimately coming up with a white paper that, we, uh, that would be a resource for our community. And all of this was funded from a research coordination network uh, that was uh, funded by the National Science uh, Foundation. So I would really uh, like to, to share with you uh, the, the fruits of this uh, work. So we uh, published a white paper called Broadening the Impact of Plant Science Through Innovative, Integrative, and Inclusive Outreach. Uh, it was definitely a, um, a massive group effort. Uh, we have uh, people from uh, all sorts of areas of academia and outside of academia. Um, who have been focused on outreach and they put in uh, their blood, sweat and tears into this uh, large document. <laughs> You're not gonna read it in, 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 in a single sitting, but it really has a comprehensive set of resources uh, and insight that you can bring to your own outreach, uh, whether you're an experienced person uh, who's done outreach for many years uh, and wants to uh, find out uh, some of the, the latest approaches, or you're, say, a, 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 a postdoc, graduate student, or new faculty member who's interested in designing an outreach program. This document is for you, and we've created it for you in the, in the broader community. So um, please feel free to, to, to utilize this resource, and it's available through open access. And through this work, uh, we not only were able to think about 
how we can make outreach more inclusive, innovate, innovative, and integrative, we also thought about the specific tools that one needs to be able to do this. So for innovative research or innovative outreach, thinking about effective pedagogy, logic models, and assessment, um, for integration, which involves sharing and rewarding excellence, of course, research conferences are an important part of that. And this workshop then is a part of our effort to uh, be able to uh, share uh, uh, outreach programs that are working effectively. And then finally, with in in inclusive outreach, uh, we've you know, also thought about how institutional context, biases, and cultural context uh, affects the effectiveness of, of outreach programs. And we'll hear a little bit about that uh, in some of our presentations today. So again, we have a fantastic set of panelists. They've put together uh, keywords for their presentations and the aspects of, of their outreach that uh, they are interested in sharing. And we'll share this slide uh, again when it comes time to deciding which uh, breakout sessions that uh, you'd like to join. So without further ado, I'll move on to the uh, short presentations and then we'll go to the breakouts. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor and I'm excited to share with you all some of the cool stuff I get to do through outreach. Right now, I'm a graduate student and 100% of all the outreach I participate in is from volunteering with different organizations. So today, I'll share some of the cool activities I participated in with a few different groups. And at the end, I'll share what I found beneficial in volunteering, as well as why outreach is important to me. Today, I'll be highlighting some of the work done from three groups, Young Sciences Program at WashU, the Ag Education Program Partnership between Danforth Center and the JJK Center, and Black Girls Do STEM. that we all lost sound. Sorry, there was no sound? There was a sound for a while, but talked about a minute ago. Oh, okay, sorry. I guess when I, when, uh, when I mute, myself it mutes this as well i'll i'll restart and Hi, hopefully Let's see what we're... okay why is p exists to promote science literacy among k through 12 students by introducing them to different areas of scientific study providing mentorship and developing their critical thinking and lab skills i've volunteered with the genetics team and i've had the opportunity to visit middle schools in st louis we've done activities learning about DNA by doing strawberry DNA extractions, which are always fun. We've even taken these learning activities to the community by participating in community fairs in North St. Louis. This spring, I had the opportunity to volunteer in the Agricultural Education Partnership between the Danforth Plant Science Center and the Jackie Joyner Kersey Center. The goal of this program is to provide STEM and ag curriculum with research experiences in genetics and molecular biology for K-12 students and even offers high school internships. I had a chance to talk with third through fourth grade students about what it's like working with plants like cotton and being a graduate student. The kids asked a lot of great questions and even showed me their cool hydroponic system in their greenhouse. The final organization I want to mention is one that I volunteer with regularly, Black Girls Do STEM. 
Black Girls Through STEM is a program that strives to spark curiosity for science in middle school Black girls by providing mentorship and hands-on science workshops. We also seek to educate them about different STEM careers with the intention to create a new normal where Black women have equal representation in all STEM fields. With Black Girls Through STEM, I'm an in-person volunteer for the monthly STEM Saturday Academy, where we do hands-on activities, learn about STEM-related careers, and have a lot of fun. We've learned about science concepts related to forensic science in the past, and just last month, we learned about civil engineering. Next, I just wanted to share what I get out of volunteering at this stage in my career. First, I really enjoy being involved in the community. Volunteering gives me the opportunity to engage with the community and allows me to connect with students and even professionals in other fields. Volunteering also helps me remember my why. I'm learning that there are sometimes highs and lows in science and it can be easy to forget our purpose when dealing with the nitty gritty details of being a scientist day to day. Through volunteering and sharing science with kids and early career scientists, I feel a sense of grounding and I'm always reminded of my own love for learning science and how cool it is. Lastly, through volunteering, I practice my science communication skills. Because let me tell you, it is no such thing as too much practice when it comes to explaining your research or general scientific concepts. As I close, I just want to share why it's so important, in my opinion, to be involved in outreach. As we all know, there's a huge gap in representation of people from diverse backgrounds in STEM. Through outreach, we can share information and give access to science education to those who otherwise may not have it and expose communities to all the opportunities that science can offer. In doing that, we can work toward minimizing the gap in representation. As a Black woman, it's important to me that students from historically excluded backgrounds like myself have equal access to opportunities. It's also important to me that students can develop a sense of identity within science in a way that helps them feel like it's a field that's suited for them. I'm so grateful for organizations like those I mentioned today and to everyone who's doing the work and providing chances for scientists to get involved. With that, I'd like to say thanks to everyone and I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you, Taylor. Next, we'll move to Ying. Today, I'd like to share some of the resources I've been using to overcome barriers during my PhD and how I'm contributing toward making them better as a postdoc. Scientists have multiple identities and a broad range of interests. As a Chinese immigrant and first-gen college student, here are some of mine. I really like to focus on mentorship, advocacy, and outreach because I think they play a significant role in diversity, which I strongly support um, and believe that diversity embraces a broad range of communities. Um, and this feeds into the value of individuals uh, in the academy. Being a diverse student in academia can be really challenging though. We are more susceptible to negative experiences that lead us eventually to feeling like it's hindering our success or dropping out. And additionally, it's always hard to find space in academia to talk about the emotional parts, like how do I combat imposter syndrome or I'm struggling to decide if I should switch labs. These are topics that we don't really talk about like a white elephant in the room. So during my PhD, I very quickly realized that my expectation was going to be really different from the reality of how I was going to get this degree and that getting help and support would be really useful. But I still had questions like, how can I find the right type of mentorship? Can I continue to pursue my outreach goals? What can be done to motivate the institution to address some of the unmet needs that my peers and I have? I feel like one main challenge is that I didn't know what I didn't know. So finding the right resource for me required a lot of self-awareness and openness to learn different things from different sources. I learned that um, academic resources at Stanford were great for developing soft skills. And so I definitely took advantage of a whole bunch of them, like the academic success coaching, which helps with confidence building and time management, um, mental health centers, and switching to a new lab so that I have more emotional and support in a group of friends the faculty mentorship program that 
connected faculty with graduate students so that we can normalize this experience through the faculty lens. Uh, the vice provost for graduate education who hosted workshops on relationship management and communication advanced, which is a graduate transition program that allowed me to find like-minded peers and also the community centers like the Graduate Life Office and the Asian American Community Center, which was really great for having community support. After finishing my PhD, I realized that these resources were useful to me because they were able to enrich my research training by mentoring me as a whole person rather than primarily focusing on my career and academic goals. And sharing these resources with my fellow cohort mates also helped them better persist through the PhD process as well. And throughout these efforts, we were able to then better work on our communities to conduct both successful research inside and out. As a new postdoc at Salk, I'm really excited to contribute to this community who is strongly supportive of diversifying academia um, by getting support from all members of the academy. So this has led to our affinity groups to be really well attended by both PIs and staff, in addition to postdocs. And this helps to take the burden of outreach um, off of just a handful of postdocs so that we can provide strong representation but then make sure we're not overtasking a handful of people. Through the Black Association at Salk, I've also made quite a number of friends and they are really great at leveraging the bandwidth and networks that they have across the affinity groups to organize um, large scale panels like the one we recently did on anti-Asian racism, providing a platform and topic that hadn't previously been discussed at the Salk. So utilizing some of these resources, I feel very hopeful that in the future, we will be better suited to prepare the next generation of graduate students and postdocs into joining the academy and giving back in a significant way. Thank you, Yin. Next, we have Jose Alonso. Hi, I'm Jose Alonso, and I would like to start by thanking Jose Guilherme for organizing this workshop on outreach. Today, I would like to tell you about a new outreach activity that a group of graduate students and postdocs started during the pandemic here at North Carolina State University. The idea was to get together a group of people doing research in biology and interested in the group yourself philosophy with the goal of providing the tools and environment for the students to design, prototype, and build electromechanical tools and devices that could directly benefit their work and then share these products and ideas in multiple group meetings. What I think is even more relevant for this workshop is that we also wanted these products to be shared with the general public through monthly demos at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, although we have not been able to do this yet due to the pandemic. Finally, this product, this product also hopes to contribute to democratize biological research by making step-by-step -step instructional manuals and demonstration videos for all the projects that we build. You're probably wondering what I actually mean by DIY projects. I think the best way to explain it is to show you a few examples of the type of DIY project we are working on. In this first video, I'm showing you what we call the ARA printer. We are using the 3D printer to paint Arabidopsis sheets in a couple of other plates. I'm still trying to improve this prototype, so a single sheet is deposited each time. But it does already a relatively good job placing mostly single sheets in precise patterns, as you can see in this video. Changing the pattern is very simple, and you can program whichever pattern you like. We have a couple of other projects where we are also using a cheap 3D printer to automate other tasks. For example, our MorphoCube 3D is an attempt to create a multi-purpose tool where a 3D printer is used to move an object, in this case a camera, in a 3D space, while a series of controllers can easily be programmed to turn on and off lights, sprayers, bugs, and so on. In this example, a camera is attached to the 3D printer head with time-lapse images of one ceiling at a time for two place work of ceilings in a parallel. By changing the objectives and light sources, we can capture high-resolution infrared images 
to monitor the food growth in the dark, as shown here in the mirror panel, or use an LED, a blue LED, to image fluorescent proteins, as shown here in this other movie on the right. We're also working on a way to sort and adapt these sheets, and there are many possible applications um, for this type of tool. And I'm showing you here our first prototype. Always try it too slow for, uh, to be practical. So we are working on all possible ideas to improve. We are also working on some much smaller and simpler projects, where, for example, we use a camera to remotely monitor experiments. So we don't need to be in the lab at three in the morning unless something really goes wrong with the experiment. Or freezer alarms that can send an uh, Alexa notification in the temperature in your minus 80 or in your door chamber, uh, which is a certain limit. Or, for example, a pH meter that can record the pH of soil samples every few minutes. I hope these examples illustrate the type of project we are thinking about and working on. But for this workshop, I think it's also important to share our short experience on how to start a DIY group for uh, biology. So again, we are a very young group, but so far we are growing, so I think things are going well. Uh, the way that we started was by me volunteer to present my view of the potential role of DIY in plant biology research in a, a one of our Friday afternoon plant genetic group meetings. And during this presentation, then I, re I requested about the interest in the audience to create a DIY group. Fortunately, a graduate student, Aurora, was very, enthusias very enthusiastic and volunteered to send emails and organize an interest group meeting. So soon we had a small but enthusiastic group of people excited about learning and doing DIY projects. The next challenge was to secure some uh, financial support so the students could start working in their ideas without having to put their own money. I thought I could help on that, so I talked about this initiative to my department head and later to uh, the college team. And I have to say that they were uh, surprisingly very supportive, finally, to move this initiative to more classical outreach activities we are teaming up with existing programs such as the Plan for Kids that Anna Stepanova is talking about also in this session, and existing non-profit DIY groups with established outreach activities. In my personal experience, it seems to me there is an interest among our students and postdocs in initiatives such as this that where we bring together DIY approaches and plant biology research. So finally, I want to thank members of the group as well as our funding sources, the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology, in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Now we have Maria Gehon. First, thank you to Jose for the opportunity to highlight some of the outreach activities in my group. Uh, my lab is interested in non-destructive uh, methods of assessing plant stress, and we utilized low-cost credit card-sized computers called Fretsbury Pies, often in our research. We became interested in this technology after the Danforth Center began investing in commercial phenotyping platforms to collect image data at high throughput. These tools are powerful but expensive, and as a postdoc at the time, myself and others were interested in technologies that might lower the cost of data collection. So on the right um, is a set of time-lapse image data collected with these low-cost Raspberry Pi computers and cameras. Our interest in Raspberry Pis led us to become more familiar with the Baker and DIY communities. And in 2014, um, after seeing a tweet, uh, we applied for money from the Raspberry Pi Education Foundation to organize community events in St. Louis focused on uh, robotics and technology. Um, we've done six of these Raspberry Pi jams since 2014, four of those funded from the Raspberry Pi Foundation money we got. And um, these events now continue for funding, with funding from the Danforth Center. We've had approximately 900 people at each of these events. Um, I'd like to say that uh, people are attracted to these events because they have an interest in plant science. Um, but typically, the attendees um, uh, come to the events uh, because they have an interest in robotics and technology. Um, so we find that this is an opportunity to introduce uh, the St. Louis community as a whole to the Danforth Center, and also to demonstrate how plant science uses advanced technologies as part of its research. Um, in addition to these community type events, we also use Raspberry Pi technologies as part of the phenotyping workshops we organize and put on several times a year. Uh, participants in these phenotyping workshops vary widely in age, um, from elementary school up to postgraduate researchers. And we've done these workshops both in person and virtually. Uh, they can take place over hours or over several days. Um, and typically during these workshops, we use Raspberry Pis to collect 
um, time-lapse image data of growing plants. And then we teach uh, participants how to extract numerical information using open source software called PlantCV, which we develop. So besides the goals of collecting and analyzing data um, in these workshops, we hope that these workshops um, get participants comfortable with making mistakes on the command line. Um, so uh, a big part of these workshops is teaching people that you don't have to worry about breaking the computer um, and to be comfortable again with making mistakes. Uh, we want participants to be comfortable with uh, using and reading software documentation um, and looking at uh, using GitHub. Um, and getting participants comfortable with error messaging so that they can uh, hopefully start to ask their instructors good questions that help to debug uh, the problems that they might run into. Typically for these mini typing workshops, um, we do these in two sections. The first part is data collection using Raspberry Pis. Through that, we teach the basics of working on the command line, um, how to snap an image using the command line, how to do time-lapse imaging, and then, ha then how to schedule time-lapse imaging using cron. Um, this GitHub link leads to um, some uh, documentation and lesson plan information that we have uh, for this first portion. And then the second half of workshops, or even entirely separate workshops, focus on the collection and analysis, uh, sorry, the analysis of collected image data. Um, so this teaches uh, skills like Python programming uh, through uh, the PlantCV software that we develop, um, use of Jupyter notebooks, and use of binary environments. Um, and then uh, once uh, numerical trait information about the plants are extracted, we can then analyze extracted trait information and do statistical analysis in R. Um, so if you're interested in talking more about our outreach projects or details of putting on bioinformatics or data science workshops virtually or in person, I'd love to discuss those and with any questions you have. Um, and with that, I'll thank uh, my lab who often participates uh, and helps with these outreach activities. Um, and especially highlighting in uh, bold uh, the plant CV development team that develops the software that we often use for outreach. Awesome. Thank you very much, Malia. Now we have Peggy Lamo. If you ever have the privilege to go out and talk to people in the public, sometimes they look at you a little weird uh, and don't quite understand what it is you're trying to say. And this is because we often use terms that we use with our colleagues that really doesn't tell them anything. And so we really have to learn how to communicate effectively with the public. So I feel like sometimes the public needs an interpreter because they see all these things in social media and, you know, on TV or in, you know, radio, wherever they get their information. And now they hear a lot about vaccinations. So that's where CLEAR comes in because our mission really is how to develop effective strategies to communicate research supported science to broad public audiences. Who are we? Uh, we're undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, junior research specialists. We're used to doing work in the lab. We don't go out and talk to the public very often. So why do do why are students interested in getting in getting involved in communicating with the, the public? Because they realize there's a lot of misinformation out there. And they realize that people don't really trust science. In fact, many people don't even know that they've ever met a scientist. So we wear t-shirts sometimes that say, talk to me, I'm a scientist. And the reason we do that is because then people realize that they actually have met a scientist. They know they've met doctors and lawyers and, and, and dentists pharmacists but they don't know that they've ever met a scientist so how do we do this where do we do this uh, we have four major areas we do clear in the community i'm going to talk mostly about that but we also do clear on campus clear in the capital and clear in the classroom and i'd be happy to answer any questions about those areas during the q a so let's focus on a little bit on clear in the community so one of the efforts that we do is at farmers markets so students are responsible for developing an activity they can show at a table and they do something different every month uh, and they try to develop things that look intriguing to people so they come up and then they get involved in it and then they can actually talk about the science behind what it is they're showing they have activities that kids can do uh, another area is in pub science so once a month we go to a pub invite an outside speaker 
or maybe one of the co students will speak about some, some science topic that they're interested in. It doesn't have to do with plants, uh, but it can be about anything. And it's just really to give students the opportunity to be able to interact with the public. After the person is done speaking, they often hang around and have a beer and talk to people about science. I also try to get students involved in talking with the media. So I get asked to talk to the media a lot. I try to give them that opportunity as well. Uh, and the reason we do this is we don't want to be appear to as the person in this picture shows of just tossing out information to the broad public uh, and not really interacting with them. And this was captured by one of the clear members who said, science communication is important because I don't want non-scientists thinking we're elitist, pretentious, ivory tower dwelling people, we're relatively normal folks. And what do we need to do to be able to do this? Uh, students have to learn new methods of communicating. These are methods that are not the way they talk to their lab mates. It's in language that people can understand when they're out talking to non-scientists. They can learn strategies from journalists because journalists obviously have to interact with the public. Uh, and so we can learn a lot from interacting with the journalists and I try to give students the opportunity to do that. Uh, and also they need to increase their just general knowledge about science. And my role is to be a mentor. Uh, and I've been doing this for 30 years and I try to help them understand how to develop methods to talk with the public. Also, I like senior students to try to mentor the younger students, for example, when they go to the farmer's market. One of the difficult things uh, about communicating with the public is not knowing exactly how to measure impact because it's not like a class where we meet with students, you know, once or twice a week for a couple months. We maybe meet with them once. And so how do you measure impact? I've come up with some ideas about how to do it, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do. But one of the other areas that I like to think about is what does the impact have on students that we mentor in programs like CLEAR? Uh, and there are a number of ways to look at that, like how engaged are they in outreach activities? Do they talk to people? Do they come up with new activities? And one of the things that I like to know is do they continue, continue doing outreach after they leave the university? And, and my experience has been the vast majority of students do continue doing outreach after they leave the university. And I think that's a valuable thing to impart into students. So I'd like to leave you with this quote, science does not speak for itself. It needs an advocate and the advocate is us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. I love that quote. That's perfect. Okay, next we have Molly Edwards. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and to have this opportunity to share my YouTube channel, Science in Real Life, with all of you today. Before I tell you anything about it, I'm actually going to show you a clip. This is from an episode that we filmed at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University about how butterfly behavior influences fox wildflower evolution. So how do we test these hypotheses? Let's go watch some pollinators. These butterflies pollinate flocks. That's right. These are pipeline swallowtail, Batis philonor, and they're the major pollinator for both of the flock species. So we raise these butterflies here at the arboretum from egg. To adult butterfly and we use them to do our behavioral experiments. So we're going to take some of these butterflies over to our floral raise and our undergraduate Sarah is going to help us grab some butterflies and bring them out. Box of butterflies! Hi so this is an example of a floral ray that we use to test pollinator behavior. So we place flowers from each species into these tubes and we observe how the pollinators forage on these flowers. Now we're gonna move into the tent and see how the pollinators perform. And we record the movements, for example, from red to red to red, or purple to purple to purple, red to purple, etc. So I hope that provides a little context for our mission statement, which is to cultivate, especially in young people, enthusiasm for and a sense of belonging in STEM. 
To accomplish this mission, in each episode, I visit a guest scientist in their lab, and we do an experiment together and discuss their research. So it's not so much about teaching our viewers a specific science concept. Instead, we want to show what it actually looks like to be a scientist in real life, how textbook concepts come to life in the lab when they're used by real researchers, and just the humanity and joy of being a scientist at work. And our viewers get introduced to tons of different researcher role models who represent their identity and help our audience to see themselves as STEM. So I, I really think it's crucial and urgent that any outreach work we do is through a lens of inclusion and belonging. We don't have a ton of time to dig into this, but whenever I talk about this aspect of my work, I definitely don't want to make it seem like I'm preaching to you from some sort of throne of wokeness. <laughs> this has been a major learning process for me and was not something I was thinking about super critically when I first started Science IRL. I was really tunnel visioned, trying to figure out how to make the thing, didn't stop so much to think about what was in the thing. So just to illustrate this, these are my guest scientists from my first season of Science IRL. And it just took a simple act of realization and stepping back to realize I had made a mistake and not been super mindful about this to recalibrate and make it central to our mission. And now these are the guests from the subsequent seasons. To give you another example, one of my science communication heroes, Ed Young, who just won the Pulitzer for his coverage of the pandemic, he's written extensively about this too. So he also had just been chugging along and doing a science writing thing. And then he did an audit of the gender breakdown of the scientists he quoted and realized that men were way overrepresented. So he also course corrected after seeing this data and easily achieved gender parity in his sources. So it really can take a brief moment of awareness and change and the impact can be tremendous. And I'm, of course, I'm not saying we're gonna you know, solve systemic racism with these sorts of efforts, but it is important that we critically evaluate our past work and make necessary changes. And Jose asked us to talk about metrics today. And I think this is a super important metric to keep track of in our work to audit our sources and make sure we're doing a good job with representation. Some recent projects that I'm really proud of include a series of 10 episodes featuring women plant biologists at leading research institutions around the country, which was funded by ASPB and ESBB. And for this work, we were recognized by UN Women's He for She program as being a force for advancing gender equality in our community. And right now I'm working on a project with a United Nations initiative called Team Halo, whose mission is to foster trust in COVID research. And so we're producing four science IRL episodes featuring COVID scientists all over the world. And we received a blog letter sponsorship from Hank and John Green to fund this work. Thanks so much to the science IRL team, to my super supportive advisor, Elena, and all the funding that's keeping Science IRL afloat. To check out Science IRL on YouTube, there are some links. And thanks, Jose, for the invitation to be part of this panel. I'm so excited to be here and to hear about all the other amazing outreach projects happening and to chat with you all later. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, Molly. Now for Anna Stepanova. Hello, my name is Anna Stepanova, and I'm an Associate Professor of Plant Biology and Genetics at North Carolina State University. Our group, the Alonso Stepanova Lab, runs several community outreach programs aimed at exposing the public to basic sciences. Our first program, Plants for Kids, has been active since 2010 and is targeted at elementary school children. We have developed a bilingual English and Spanish set of easy to do experiments with plants that teach kids how to set up, run, and interpret basic science experiments using materials that can be found around the house. Each of the 14 experimental web modules we developed specifically for kids consists of six sections, questions to be addressed, materials needed, directions on how to execute the experiments, helpful hints and suggestions, expected results, and follow-up questions. The best part of our experiments is that they're very low cost or even free. As both, kids can use recycled containers from rinsed yogurt cups to empty egg cartons. As a substrate, anything from dirt to napkins to shredded junk mail works well. And for a seed source, we recommend dry peas, these or lentils from Mount's pantry, or air dried seeds of cantaloupes or pumpkins from grocery store bought fruits and vegetables families eat. Kids get to explore the effects of light, gravity, water, temperature, and so on, and plant growth. And several of our projects that I mentioned utilize readily available seeds. One of the most simple visual experiments is light versus dark. Most kids expect that plants won't be able to germinate in the dark. And I'm surprised to discover that dark germinated seedlings grew taller than their light grown counterparts. This usually brings about a lot of questions as to why that is the case and where the nutrients have come from. 
especially in dark brown plants. Another set of experiments we have developed rely on plant material it can find outside, such as dry branches, stems, leaves, and flowers, or in some cases, find things at home in the fridge, of course, with mom's permission. For example, food coloring experiments with wildflowers are a lot of fun and teach kids about water and nutrient transport. To disseminate these experimental modules, in pre-COVID times, we ran monthly demos at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and did classroom visits on demand. We have done over 130 live demos, ranging in duration from two to eight hours, reaching out to thousands of kids. Prior to the quarantine, our lab has also been working on producing plants for kids' videos, as some of our youngest clients do not yet know how to read. So we hope to provide video instructions, and for that, hired a talented bilingual NCSU student, Eduardo Santana, and had Spanish-speaking children, whom my former lab member, Javier Gomez, volunteer as kid actors. Another avenue we're employing to reach out to the public are educational YouTube videos. My lab creates videos that explain the technologies we're using in our own research, as well as biological processes that we are studying. My molecular genetics graduate students make extra credit videos explaining basic scientific concepts they learned in class to disseminate their knowledge to the general public. And finally, my own biological kids, now both teenagers, make educational videos about a variety of topics from GMO and CRISPR to machine learning and artificial intelligence. This part of our outreach effort continues during the pandemic. And finally, my lab group is working on a new initiative of implementing a library for basic lab equipment that would enable North Carolina teachers to do basic molecular work in their classrooms. We have developed a week-long hands-on module on recombinant DNA and synthetic biology for high schools and tested our modules in two biology classrooms Athens Drive High School in Raleigh in the hands of 43 students, all pre-COVID. Students got to extract plasma DNA, run PCR and restriction digest, pour gels, perform gel electrophoresis, set up circular polymerase extension cloning reactions, prepare competent E. coli cells, transform into bacteria, and select transform cells using blue white collection. All the work is done on portable, miniaturized equipment that we provide. Our plan is to organize a series of week-long teacher training workshops for high school biology teachers, and then have trained teachers rent the equipment and supplies from our library free of charge to implement the experiments in their classrooms. This work is funded by the National Science Foundation and several local biotech industries committed to helping stock the library with supplies. Our first workshop was supposed to happen in June of 2020, but COVID-19 forced us to postpone it until all COVID concerns are resolved. Well, this gives us extra time to further optimize our experimental modules, and we hope to accommodate more teachers in the summer of 2022. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Anna. Beautiful work. Okay, now our last presentation before we get to the breakout, we have uh, Rupesh uh, Karia. Hi, uh, my name is Rupesh Karia. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Today, I'm going to talk about, or give you a snapshot of the science outreach that we do at UTRD. Um, UTRD is located uh, in uh, South Texas. Um, we are a 90% Hispanic student body. A lot of students live with their family, and uh, a lot of them are non-traditional, and uh, a significant um, student body is also first generation students. They are the first ones from their family to uh, come to university. We are also one of the schools which have uh, very low um, student loans, and there are a lot of scholarships and fellowships uh, that uh, the university provides for students. Uh, science outreach at UTRT can be broadly classified into three. Uh, there are university events, for example, Hispanic Engineering, Science and Technology Week. There are departmental events, bilingual classes, courses, etc. And there are targeted events for individual research labs. Uh, for example, school visits is something that my lab usually uh, do. Uh, when I got to UTRT, and I, I'm, I have always been interested in education and outreach in addition to research. So uh, I started looking for what are the main bottleneck in outreach at this place. And uh, what I understood was, Students are more interested in medical fields because families are not aware of other opportunities. Ag sciences, plant sciences are associated with hard field labor. And the importance of uh, plant or agricultural education as a career option is not very well defined. Although USDA constantly say that we lack 
uh, skill the labor for a lot of these jobs which are available with USDA. So clearly there was a mismatch. Uh, so I started looking at how can I fix it and uh, instead of like, um, instead of trying to do outreach activities across the board, I wanted to target what I could actually make a difference. So what I understood was the incoming students have already made their mind not to study plant sciences. So the intervention is something that has to proceed undergraduate education. So we should go to high school or high school teachers. So with this idea in mind, I wrote this plan, Plan Globe, which is a SPB American Society for Plant Biology Outreach and Education Grant by, um, by suggesting um, or proposing workshops and boot camps for high school teachers so that they can uh, do better with their curriculum. So that's what we did. So we got the school teachers from a school district and then uh, we gave them easy to do experiments and by with that we updated their curriculum. And uh, we got like, we, we knew that with just 10 teachers, we could reach more than 1000 or more students. Uh, Justine who was my um, graduate student at that time, she's a uh, PhD student now. She uh, was one of the person who helped us with the workshop. So I got different faculty members every day, one faculty member would uh, uh, do the boot camp. And uh, one of the things that we understood was um, the teachers really wanted easy to do experiments, which could also help them to teach a little bit complicated um, concepts in um, plant sciences. Uh, so I'm going to use one of the examples from my field, plant insect interactions. One of the fundamental question is how do these herbivores uh, find their host plant? We see a lot of herbivores and a lot of plants, but you don't see all of them eating each other. So when I was a grad student, uh, I worked on inbreeding depression in plants. And uh, when you have inbred and outbred plants from the same species, the herbivores are able to find the inbred plants more often because they were less in low in toxins. So I'm going to show you a video. This is a caterpillar which is trying to locate, uh, locate the leaves for feeding. Uh, it is starving and it has never been exposed uh, to leaves. So you can see it is lifting its head and then, uh, and then walking and then. I'm going to fast forward because of time. So you can clearly see that uh, the, the caterpillar was able to locate the leaf, which was low in toxin, and we did this many times, obviously. So such a simple video, but uh, I was able to use this video to talk to these teachers and say that, look, if you have two different horse plants, we can do the same thing. And then we set up all these um, uh, pit dishes in the class you can see here in the first slide um, and they were able to understand these concepts and then we gave them some theory to go with it and uh, this is how all the days like every different faculty member did the similar stuff we published this paper and we got very uh, good response from the teachers they all enjoyed the workshop very much it was intense uh, five days no other activity from morning to evening um, and so that was what we did <clears throat> Uh, what are the things that doesn't work? Any complicated curriculum improvement is not going to fly. New techniques that require a lot of resource and institutional investment is not going to work so fast. If you are not clear about the end goal, that's also not going to happen. So what I also did was I used that data from that paper and also from that uh, grant, and I, I asked for more money with the USDRU. That's a five-year grant where I want to send students for externships and uh, in the plant sciences, and then they come back after these externships, either these government or private agency would hire them or they will have a better career option in plant sciences. So got the grant, we are now working on that. Um, due to the lack of time, I'm gonna stop here and I want to thank the GRPB, SPB and USDA and Dr. Jose for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Ripesh.